Thank you, Mark. Thank you, choir. Uh, Mark knew what I was going to be preaching on today, and he picked the music accordingly, and for that I'm thankful. Appreciate that. Um, if you have your Bible, open it to Ephesians chapter number 2, series uh, on uh, being a God-pleaser. Hebrews 11:6 tells us that it is impossible to please God without faith, but he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So we've been talking about what faith means because it is so very important. And we want to be people of faith, but here's the thing, it's a challenge. It's a challenge. Because we so much to want to walk by sight. We want to walk by what we think we can do, and what we believe that we can do. And if God pushes us beyond those boundaries, the only thing that we can do is walk a life that is God-sized. And that, that pleases him when we trust him to do that much. So um, today, I, I had a video I was going to play. And uh, I, it is prepped and it is ready, and I, we're not going to play it. Is that fair? I got a little bit under conviction. There's nothing wrong with the video I was going to play. But if it's okay, I'm just going to preach salvation. Amen. Stand with me. Ephesians 2, verse 1. But you he made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. Those two great words in verse 4. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved, and raised us up together, and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come, can I say the eternal ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. I'm going to repeat that. For by grace... He is speaking to Christians there at Ephesus. You have been saved through faith, and that not of yourself, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And then I want to read one verse from uh, 1 Timothy uh, chapter 2, verse 3. Just, just listen to this verse. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. Hear this phrase. Who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. All men. He's talking about all peoples. That is God's desire. For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time, for which I am appointed a preacher and an apostle. And then I normally pray during this time, but if it's okay, I just want to read two verses from Ephesians 6 and let that be my prayer. And for me, it 
that utterance may be given to me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador, that in it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. You may be seated. I just want to tell a story that I've told so many times in my life. I enjoyed sharing it with uh, the children in vacation Bible school because their eyes are wide open. I enjoyed it because uh, I could look around and I could see upon their faces. There were some of them that were deeply listening to God. And I remembered how I felt. I came to know Christ as a young boy, probably later than I should have, but I had too much of me. I was too full of pride. Um, I felt the drawing of God. We call it the wooing of the Spirit, where God in His love made it personal to me to let me know that though he loved others, he loved me. Though he had saved others, he would even save me. That when Christ died on the cross of Calvary, that that included me. That I could receive Jesus as my Savior. And as John 3.16 says, I should except Jesus Christ is my Savior. But I was in a dilemma. For I knew that I had sinned, and I knew that I was separated from God because of my sin. And I definitely believed in Him, and I knew what He had done for me. But the dilemma was, would I say yes? Would I receive the free gift that was being proffered, offered to me? What I say to God, who had done so very much, and it is a complete work of Christ, would I accept what he and what he only could do? False doctrine, and there is much false doctrine today on salvation, is usually where Satan comes in to try to add to or take away from what happened on the cross of Calvary. And any time you hear anyone say anything that is trying to say, it, it, it's what Jesus did plus this, false doctrine. If any time they want to say, well, you know, he didn't really do all this, that's taken away from the cross of Calvary. False doctrine. We can't add to it, though many try. We can't take away from it. It's Christ in Christ alone. It's the shed blood of Christ. And most definitely, are we in need? When Paul wrote this letter to the church at Ephesus, he knew this church. He knew it well. He wrote it from Rome where he was in prison for the gospel. But he spent years there. As a matter of fact, one of the wonderful phrases uh, is that while he was there, in, in, in leading as a preacher and an apostle in Ephesus, it said everyone in Asia Minor heard the gospel. What a powerful statement. They knew that because they were Christians, they had a commission. And it wasn't simply a commission to be, it was a commission to go. They were compelled to share with others what God had done for them. That if God had saved the, him, God would save them. And it doesn't matter if it was in large groups or if it was in house groups or one-on-one. -on -one. Everyone in that entire providence, wouldn't it be amazing if we could say today that everyone in our entire providence had the opportunity to hear the good news of Jesus Christ? And they must hear. For how can they be saved unless someone preaches? If someone doesn't tell them the story of Christ, I love the songwriter Fanny Crosby, the blind one. 
Tell me the story of Jesus. Write on my heart every word. Tell me the story most precious. This is my privilege today to share the old, old story that is real and right and relevant and so very needful today. Some believe that they're Christians because they were born into a family. God forbid. Some believe that they were Christians simply because they're uh, someone, that, that they were taken to a place where the gospel was preached. As a matter of fact, if you did surveys, we are told today that if you walked up and down the streets and you asked someone if they're a Christian, that they would say, 90% of the people say, yes, they're Christian, but we know that that's not true. Some believe that they're Christian because they're born in America. That's not true. God comes with his offer of salvation, listen to me, one heart at a time. One heart at a time. God is exactly where he needs to be, on the throne in heaven, listening to prayers. And if you would be so wise to receive the offer of Christ, he's promised that he would receive it. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So why are people not saved? Some believe that they don't need to be saved. Some believe that they're good in and of themselves. Paul addressed this in verse 1. He quickened you. He made you alive who were dead in your trespasses and sin. Our sins made us dead in the eyes of God. Our pure, holy, sanctified God cannot have a relationship with sin. One must come and forgive. One must come who is qualified to forgive, and Christ is the only one. But he says to us, because of our sin, we're dead. And, and I don't care what anybody says, there's not any degrees of death. You're not just a little bit dead. You look at somebody else, well, man, they're a whole lot dead. I mean, they really need Jesus because they're really dead. No, just dead. Seems like, I, have y'all noticed all the commercials today and all the, the stories and the movies talk about zombies? Well, the truth of the matter is there's a whole lot of dead people walking on this earth. They're dead in their trespasses and sins. And God knew that. And God is a gentleman. He will not do for them what they do not want. He will not force them to receive what they do not want to receive. But he is offered. And he said, if you understand that you are dead, and he says that the salvation is there for you. In verse 2 he says, in which once you once walked according to the course of this world. I think sometimes Christians forget what it was like to be lost. How would you like, hold on, this is not the way that it works. Don't quote me and get me wrong. This is not the way that it works. But how would you like if I could come back there and take away your salvation and you were lost once again? Now, that's not the way that it works, but can you remember what it felt like? Would you run down this altar and not even wait for an invitation and say, I don't want to spend 10 seconds without having a relationship with the holy God of the universe who controls everything? A God who is pure and perfect and good, and he would invite me in to have a relationship with him where the sinful man that I am, I can be forgiven and I can have that which is pure and right and good, perfect. He said, we were all once there, walking according to the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of dis disobedience, the prince of the power of the air. There are three things that, are, that lead us astray, the world, our own desires, our flesh, and Satan. And they want to pull you away from God. We all were the ones there. He says, among whom we also conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. A dog barks simply because he's a dog. A person who does not know Christ 
Sin simply because they're a sinner. If you think that you've straightened yourself out and you've reformed yourself, you're still dead. You need one that can resurrect. But God who is rich in his mercy. Mercy means that which we do not receive that we do deserve. We have sinned against a holy God. We do not deserve to be forgiven. We do not deserve to have the love of God. We do not deserve to rehab an eternal relationship with God where God would never leave us or forsake us, who would provide for us and give us his best. We do not deserve that. But God is rich in his mercy. And he wants to share in his goodness. Because of his great love toward, with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, he made us alive. He did for us what only he could do. I cannot tell you how many funerals I've done. Went to a funeral this week. I didn't conduct the funeral, but I was there, a three-year-old boy. Those are the hardest. He loves superheroes. He had a Superman coffin. He was dressed in Superman outfit in the coffin. Batman was there. Wonder Woman was there. Captain America was there. Superman was there. By the way, I knew Superman. I thought the preacher was going to wear a cape, but he didn't. They tried to honor the life, but the dad, <laughs> the dad who was deployed, getting ready to go to Afghanistan, this happened Saturday a week ago, his son, three-year-old son, drowned. I praise God for the army. They, they flew the dad back on Sunday with the chaplain and his best friend. He has another week before he has to go back. I don't know how the father got the strength. A few people had said the dad was his hero. But the dad stood up and said, no, Jesus Christ was his hero. He's my hero. Because he kept me from dying an eternal death and staying in my condemned condition, condition forever. Forgive me. I'm grateful that Christ loved me. And the thing about us is we think we're good enough. But we're not. And we don't need to be. As long as there's a God in heaven who loves the way that he does, qualified. Revelation 4 talks about the books, that the, the, the book that would be opened. If you read the book of Daniel, you come to the end of that. He told Daniel to seal the book. But when you come to Revelation, he said that the, the scrolls would be opened. Who in heaven could come and take the scroll and open it up? And there was none. But one step forward, as though a lamb that had been slain, who could take the book and open up. He was there before Genesis 1-1 and knew what would happen and was willing. Who put the plan of salvation in place before the world began and yet did it in love and walked the, the Dia Velarosa, the way to the cross, took the weight of the world Preacher, you make much of salvation. You better believe it. I have nothing without my salvation. I have no standing. My goodness will not make it. Being a preacher will not make it. 
I'm a child of the King because of Christ and Christ alone. I didn't have to pray an eloquent prayer. I just had to pray it from my heart to his. But verse 8 says, For by grace, God's goodness that you cannot do for yourself, we are saved through faith. Not of works. You can't do it. But we've been talking for the last eight weeks about faith. Faith is acting upon the Word of God. Faith is saying, this is what God says, this is what God knows, and because I believe that, I will put, in that, put it into action in my life. You may say, well, I believe in Jesus. I believe he was God's son. I believe that he came to earth. I believe that he went to the cross. I believe that he rose again. The Bible says even Satan knows those things and trembles. Having a head knowledge is not enough. You have to willfully ask the Lord into your life. It takes conversion. It takes receiving the offer of God. Nobody else can do that for you. Billy Graham's a lot smarter man than I could ever be. Because of the position that God placed him in, he did crusades all over the world. Nobody ever preached to more people than Billy Graham. And you've seen him, and you know what I'm talking about. And the, the, he, he would preach a simple message, and people would just come down, and, and they couldn't get to know one-on-one -on -one all those people, and they would fill out a card. And, and I received Jesus Christ as my personal Savior and Lord. But they were, he'd also look at the card. They were already church members. A lot of people, he said, walked in aisle and got baptized, but they never gave their heart and life to Christ. And adults, please hear me now. This is the reason I'm in the ministry. I know it's God's call in my life. I know that. But it bothers me that Satan is a deceiver. And I talk to adults, and they don't remember. A, you don't have to know the date. God's got that. But if you don't remember praying and doing business with God, and you just assume, there's some things in life you can take a chance on, but your eternal salvation is not one of them. I have never tried to guilt someone. I've never tried to scare someone, though I think we should be scared of spending eternity without Christ. But what I've always said and I believe with all my heart is if you don't 100%, 1,000% sure, you need to be. I call it driving down a stake. I can get, take you to my property up at Habersham. We own some property. Well, I say we own some property. The bank owns some property. And even when they, get, Lord willing, we're going to get that thing paid off pretty soon. But even if they do, they give me a deed. I don't own that thing. I'm going to die and somebody else will have it. The only thing I really earn or own is my salvation. Because it's the only thing that lasts. But if you walk up there on my property, I can take you to the corner of my property and I can show you a stake. And it's got a mark on it. And you may say, well, I, hold on, no. I, I, think, I think that's your property, and I don't think this is your property. No, the person who knows drove it down. My wife walked an aisle when she was 12 years old because the preacher talked her into it. She got baptized, and she was a church member. But when she was in college, her first year of college, there was a young man teaching, a, a college student teaching a Bible study, and she said, the God that he had was not the God that she had. And she did business with God, and she got saved. Billy Graham was a church member before he went to a revival service and got saved. In my ministry, I have seen preachers and deacons get saved. I'm not, one Sunday night, I was preaching, and, and to be honest, I wasn't even going to give an invitation. I was going to pray and close out the service. But I could tell somebody walked down an aisle. Preachers know those things. And she was kneeling down there. And I knelt down with her and I said, how can I help you? 
She looked up at me and she says, Preacher, I just got saved. <laughs> and I said, Good gosh, you could have knocked me down with a feather. I wasn't preaching on salvation. I wasn't trying to scare anybody to, to heaven, Mark. It was the convicting power of God. And she came down. Now, you don't have to pray the prayer here, but I think it's a pretty good place. But whether you're here or whether you're there, do business with God. Confess your sins. Tell him that you're dead. Understand that you can't do it by yourself. But God did it for you. Listen, by faith, you've got to trust him. You've got to trust him. I can't convince you. I can show you the word, but I can't convince you. If I could, I would. Because you'd have the gospel according to Brian. And that's not going to get you anywhere. But you have to, how many of y'all seen Jesus? Or heard a voice, an audible voice? But I know he's there. And he has spoken to my heart. And I gave him my all. Andy's right there. We got a code word. Somebody comes through that back door with a gun. I praise God for a man that will get between me and him. Amen. He'll come out here and he'll take the bullet for me. Y'all good with that? Man, Mandy says she, she's glad that he'll take the bullet for me too. I don't know. Yeah. If somebody came through that door with a gun, I mean, I'm, I'm not ready to go today, but I am. Y'all hear me? And if they pointed at my head and said, Jesus or death? I'd have to say Jesus and the rest is up to you. Story was told, and I'm going to close. It was in the, this is in the days of the Soviet Union. You may have heard the story. There was a, a house church meeting together. There was a group of soldiers that came in with guns. And they said, we want to be good and right about this. If you do not know Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord, if you're not part of that group, you just leave. And a group of them got up and left. And there they were. With the, there was a group that stayed, though that there were soldiers with guns. And after everyone left, they put their guns down and said, we're Christians too. We just wanted to know who the real Christians were. I don't know what your litmus test is between knowing that you're saved or not. I'm not trying to make you doubt anything. Please don't get me wrong. All I'm asking you is, have you trusted Christ as your Savior and Lord? Do you remember a time where you confessed your sins and prayed to Him and asked Him to come into your heart? Have you trusted in that? Now, most of you have done that. I would say a vast majority have. And as I said those words, something went off in your heart, and you said, that's me. I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. In your heart, you felt the blessed assurance that Jesus is yours. And to that, I say, amen. Amen? amen. But if you couldn't, you're the one that I'm speaking to. Heads bowed, eyes closed. If you're here today and you're not 100%, 1,000% sure that Jesus is your Savior and Lord, I know in this moment it's easy to be distracted. But I believe God put this on my heart. My cup's overflowing. And I believe there's somebody here today that needs to give their heart and life to Christ.
you know that you have sinned. You know that Jesus came to take your place, to take your sin. He went to the cross and died, gave his life. He was buried, but three days later he rose again. He is alive and well and listening to you right now. And if you have not accepted Christ, I pray that he is speaking to your heart. He is wooing you. He is drawing you. He is compelling you. Preacher, what do I have to do? From your heart to God. Say, Jesus, I'm a sinner. Some of you need to say, and I've said that to you many times. I believe you are God's son. I believe that you came to earth. And you went to the cross and you gave your life for me. And I know you rose again and you want to save me. Lord, I repent of my sins. From your heart to God, say, come into my heart and save me. All my heart, all my life, I give to you. Lord, thank you for saving me. Help me never be ashamed of you. I will stand for you. Heads bowed, eyes closed all over the building. If you prayed that prayer and you asked the Lord into into your heart, would you just look up at me right now? Look up, make eye contact with me. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, Lord, thank you. Thank you for doing for us what only you can do. Now, Lord, I pray that those that prayed to you give them the courage and the boldness to begin to walk their new life and tell others what they have done may may they not be ashamed and lord i thank you for the gift of baptism lord where we can publicly profess what you did for us that we can say that we are a part of your family lord bless this invitation I pray those, for those that are already Christians that came to this building today. I pray that you give them great comfort to know that they know that they know. And Lord, if there's someone that still needs to pray, you be kind. I pray if it be possible, if it be your will, you would give them another opportunity. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. I'm going to be standing here up front. And if any of you feel led to come and and take me by the hand and say, Preacher, that was me. I prayed that prayer. I'll help you with that beginning of that walk. But I think it's a great first step to publicly do that and tell someone. Would you stand with me?